we've looked at one large topic on Unit 4. We just have a further three to consider. So class is a big area. We looked at theories of class and changes to the class structure. We will now be looking at the reasons why women experience inequality in the workplace and we will particularly be examining the theories behind this inequality as well as briefly looking at some of the statistics. We will be revisiting many of the, many of the theories that we examined when studying for the class. This is useful because many of the topics and concepts that we've looked at previously will come up again when we study gender and will also come up again when we study ethnicity and age. So as I said, the aim of the screencast is to consider the ways in which women experience inequality in the workplace and examine the theories behind this. So you will be expected to take notes, ignore the statistics on gender, um, you will have a handout with those statistics on, but just make sure that you understand the statistics and then take notes um, about the different theories using the Cornell method. The key concepts that we will be considering are horizontal segregation, vertical segregation, functionism and human capital theory, Catherine Hakim preference theory, dual labour market theory, which is a Weberian view, functionalism, we're particularly looking at biological determinism, Oakley, who is a feminist who argues gender is a social construction, radical feminism, particularly focuses on patriarchy, we'll be revisiting Weber and applying that to theory of gender inequality, we're particularly looking at market situation and status. Marxism, Marxist feminism, the reserve army of labour, Wolby triple systems theory, Adkins sexualisation of women's work and Stanko's sexual harassment. So some of these studies will be familiar to you as they did come up in Unit 1, so you may recognise some names. Also, some of these concepts are, are nothing new. So in terms of, of workplace inequality, there have been many improvements. And partly this is due to a number of equal opportunity legislation that was brought in to make it more equal for women. So this included the 1970 Equal Pay Act, which ensured that all women would be paid equally for the same job or a similar type of job that men were doing. The Sexual Discrimination Act in 1974 made it illegal to discriminate, discriminate against women on the basis of their, their sex. This was largely due to employers perhaps discriminating against women because they thought that they may leave their, their job um, and didn't want to invest in a woman because they may leave due to childcare. And then finally, the Equality Act. The Equality Act required all public bodies to take an active role in removing illegal discrimination against women. So. The Equality Act followed in 2006, part of the reason that it followed in 2006 was because of some of the flaws of the Equal Opportunity legislation brought in in 1970 and the difficulty of proving sexual discrimination. If we look at some of the statistics, we can consider the impact that Equal Opportunity legislation has had. So in 1971, 92% of men of working age were employed compared to 56% of women. By 2005, 80% of men were working and the proportion of women had risen to 70%. Now, on face value, this looks favourable. But if we continue to look at the statistics, we found the Labour Force survey found that 42% of women in employment worked part-time, but only 10% of men. 
So the 2005 statistics don't take into account that many women are actually working part-time rather than full-time. Most of the rise in female employment is due to the amount of married mothers who work. And you will find that this is the theme coming up generally. The fact that women are expected to take the burden or not the burden. Um, it depends on which way you, you see it. But women generally um, will take on the family and looking after the house and the housework. And this impacts on their career choices. So it's interesting to look at the gender gap and compare the different countries to see exactly how unequal Britain is. Because it is generally assumed that you know women are unequal all over the world. It's not just the UK where there's issues. But if we look at the gender gap in median earnings of full-time employees, so this is disregarding any part-time employees, we can see there is a massive gap of 21% in the UK in 2006. This compares to Belgium, where it's only 9%. So these statistics can Genu generally question the sorts of theories that explain why women are unequal. For example, if we're to support the functionist argument, which we'll be looking at in a minute, that women's inequality is due to their biological function, that they need to be looking after the children, then the statistics show that this explanation cannot be correct. Because we would expect countries where there were more traditional gender roles to have higher wage inequality, if this was the case. So we'll be now looking at earnings. As I said, you do need to be making notes, but try not to make notes on the statistics as such, because we'll be doing some work on statistics. In lesson. So in terms of earnings, in 1970 women working full-time earned 63% of the average male full-time wage. In 1975 this figure had increased to, 90, to 71%. In 2005 this figure was 82%. There have been significant differences between men and women over time. And although these differences have improved, they remain even when they are carrying out similar types of work. Obviously, this goes against the Equal Pay Act. We'll be looking at some of the cases that women have brought against um, public bodies regarding the Equal Pay Act, particularly a group of women cleaners in Birmingham. So in 2005, women in the medical profession earned 23% less than men, in the legal profession 21% less, in accountancy 15% less, and science and technology professions, professionals earned 14% less. Now, part of this may be due to women receiving less pay for similar types of jobs. In part, it may be due to men taking the more senior positions. So what we'll look at next is horizontal and vertical segregation. So horizontal and vertical segregation refers to the way in which men and women take on different types of, of work. So women are segregated horizontally. So if we imagine a horizontal line is a line across the page. So women and men do different types of jobs at the same level. 
So an example of horizontal segregation might be women are largely employed in administration type work, whereas men are employed more in manual type work. Those jobs may be of the same pay, but they're different gendered work roles. And then vertical segregation, if we imagine a line from top to bottom of the page, that refers to the fact that men have higher status jobs and higher paid jobs than women. So you will have managers at the top um, and then super, supervisory positions perhaps in, in, the, in the middle and then the lower paid jobs at the bottom. So not only are women are doing different types of jobs, they're doing the lower paid, lower status jobs. So the statistics are clear. There's no debate that women are unequal in British society, despite the fact that people think that feminism is now outdated and no ro longer relevant to today's society. So we're looking at some evidence of horizontal and vertical segregation. Again, you don't need to write these statistics down, but you do need to listen carefully. So, <clears throat> as you know, men and women are not equally represented through their occupational structure. If we look at um, some of the statistics, we find that women are often employed in what we call the five C's. Caring, cashiering, catering, cleaning and clerical occupations. And men are employed in a wider range of occupations. Women predominate in sectors such as health and social work, education, hotels and rest restaurants, while men predominate in construction, transport, storage and communication and manufacturing. Men predominate in manual occupations, particularly in skilled trades, whereas women predominate in personal service, administrative and secretarial and sales and customer services. Men still comprise nearly two thirds of managers, but by 2005 there were almost as many female as male professionals. The proportion of female managers and professionals has been increasing in recent years. In 2005, three quarters of pharmacists, 40% of accountants, a third of doctors and almost 50% of lawyers were women. 83% of directors and chief executives of an average earning of £56.33 an hour in 2005 were men. And 75% of waiters and waitresses, average earnings of £5.50 an hour, were women. Men predominate in all the higher paid jobs except personnel, training and industrial relations managers while women predominate in all the lower paid jobs except sport and leisure assistants. Where the numbers of men and women are equal, women are underrepresented in elite positions. So, for example, in 2004, only 9% of senior judges were women, 10% of senior police officers were women, and 13% of national newspaper editors were women. Women held only 10.5% of the directorships of the FTSE 100 companies and 19.7% of MPs and 27.3% of cabinet ministers were female. This has now changed. There are now less cabinet members that are female. Although most teachers are women, in 2004 only 31.8% of head teachers were female. So this clearly shows horizontal and vertical segregation. Horizontal segregation, women doing different types of work, and vertical segregation, women doing the lower status jobs. So how do we explain this then? Functionalists have explained it saying that women are biologically different to men and that biological differences form the basis of the sexual division of labour. So as we've looked at before, there's a specialised division of labour where people do different tasks. The division of labour that Murdoch refers to is the fact that men are more likely to do the work, paid work in the workplace and women are likely to stay at home and look after the children. They argue that biological differences such as the greater physical strength of men and the fact that women bear children lead to gender roles out of sheer practicality. A sexual division of labour, they argue, is the best and most efficient way of organising society. It works, it functions well.